Well, happy Memorial Day. <laughs> I didn't know whether I was going to do one for the holiday or not, but I decided to go ahead and since I was a little lazy on Friday, uh, we've been looking at the book of Genesis. It's really quite interesting. Uh, Dr. Phillips uh, talks about how many times uh, stories are told best in very brief form and uses uh, Genesis as an example. He says in chapter 1, verse 1, it tells us everything that occurred between Genesis 1, 2 and chapter 2, verse 3, which is absolutely correct. <laughs> As a summary, it says God created the heavens and the earth, and he did. Uh, we're really looking at, uh, as we go through this beginnings, the beginning of the universe, uh, we're not talking about the beginning of God, he's eternal. A sovereign God, a powerful God, a God that can speak things into existence, who can fling a solar system into space in perfect orbit and create it in the order we know that would have to be created in order to sustain life. We had the water first, then light, then we had plant life, sea life, uh, birds and beasts and wild animals, and, and then finally man. But the unique thing that we saw was the phrases that repeat themselves in just one chapter. Uh, first phrase was, God said. The second phrase, what, and it was so. And it was good. And then we saw the fact that it was morning and night and one day, giving us a time frame and telling us that the stars, the moon and the sun were placed there to be able to mark our calendars and to keep track of time, so it, it pretty well does away with the time gap kind of a philosophy about taking billions of years and that, that days were not literal days. Nevertheless, the one creation that was totally different uh, was the fact that God said he was going to make man in his own image, in his own likeness, male and female, not 24 different varieties of sexes, but male and female. And each of the other animals, he caused them to be different, not in his image and not after his likeness, but both beast and man were told to multiply and be fruitful to fill the earth. <clears throat> but it also says something very interesting against evolution. It says that each animal was to bear after its own kind. Now, it's really quite interesting to me that science has kingdoms and phyla, uh, but they don't have anything in between. They don't have any evolutionary uh, animals or plants or uh, so on. It, it's true that our big toe may be getting smaller, uh, but, but we're not talking about that kind of evolution. We're talking about going from an amoeba uh, into a uh, primate, and that just isn't at all the evidence that we have of any kind of evolutionary process still ongoing. So we see this very interesting uh, beginnings, if you will. And when God got to the end of his creation, uh, he looked around and he said in verse 31, it is very good. And that's the sixth day. Then he sanctified the seventh day, set it aside because man needs a day of rest. God didn't need to rest, but man needs the rest and set that example for us. Now, as we enter into chapter 2 at verse 4, we find that God is now almost as if he's at Mount Sinai with Moses explaining a little bit more about man and how he was created. Almost as if Moses asked God, said, well, I don't understand. You, you created the heavens and the earth. You created the animals, the plant life but then you created man after your own image. And it's almost as if uh, God is uh, going back for Moses to explain a flashback, if you will, of uh, this creation. So I want us to take a look at verse four and following and see a little bit more about what God may have said to Moses on Mount Sinai. This is an account of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made earth and heaven. Now no shrub of the field was yet in the earth, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted, for the Lord God had not sent rain upon the earth, and there was no man to cultivate the ground. 
but a mist used to rise from the earth and the water and water the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. And the Lord God planted a garden toward the east and Eden and there he placed the man whom he had formed out of the ground of the, the the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing in the sight and good for food and the tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil now it seems to go that God is giving a little brief summary again of his creation but he's also making an introduction into why he created man there was no one to cultivate the garden uh, there was no one to have dominion over the earth. And so although he had created all of these wonderful things, he recognized that there was a need for man. And I think it's very, very interesting when we think about the fact that man was made from the earth of the ground. And today, scientifically, we know that man is made up of all of the elements that are commonly found in the earth. As a matter of fact, we know that 99% of man is made up of just a few elements, oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, calcium, and phosphorus. 99% of man made up of just those elements. And yet another 0.85%, that is almost the other 1%, are still elements commonly found in the earth, sulfur, potassium, sodium, chloride, and magnesium. And so we have an account of God making it from earth and today science has proved that man is made up of the elements of the earth. The one thing that we've never been able to duplicate is life itself. Uh, we can clone animals, we can do other things taking existing cells and existing DNA, but we can't create life itself. But it tells us clearly here in this passage of scripture, God blew life into man. It was God who put life in man. It was God who created life. And we have just been reproducing life for all of these years since. There's another very interesting thing that I hope you'll go back and study carefully. It's one that I've taken two days to just kind of get a satisfaction about the, the facts of these things. Uh, many times we never stop and ask ourselves, God created all of these trees, but he only named two. And he only talks about two in significance. One is the tree of life. The second is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why did he name these two trees? Why did he bring this in at the same time that he's talking about the creation of man? It's quite fascinating, really, if you really get into it and study for example, the tree of life. What was it? Where did it come from? Are we talking about symbolic only or are we talking about a literal tree? Well, I believe it's both symbolic and literal. <laughs> you say, how could it be both? Well, I believe that it was a literal tree and I believe that it symbolically represents eternal life. Uh, the one that could come through Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at this, we also see that there is another tree in the garden. This one is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Uh, we can certainly understand the tree of life as being something that would give somebody eternal life. After all, we all fantasize about uh, springs of water that might give you eternal life or that might give you health healing powers or whatever. But uh, what about this tree of knowledge of good and evil? What does that really mean? Uh, Certainly, we have a, a general sense about what is good and what is evil. Well, I think it goes beyond that. And here I'm going to tell you my opinion after reading several commentaries and having prayed about it myself. I believe that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was a tree that let you know everything about everything. Everything good and everything evil, which would then put you on the plane with God. If you knew everything about everything, uh, it would put you on the same level with God because he certainly knows everything about everything. And that may explain a little bit better as we go on in our study 
as we continue through the book of Genesis. Just want you to start to look at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. You're going to find if you do an extensive study and you do an exhaustive concordance study that you'll find the tree of life appears four times clearly. Twice in the book of Genesis and twice in the book of Revelation. You see, somehow after the Garden of Eden, God transplanted that tree of life into heaven. The tree of life went to heaven and that will become very much clearer when we continue our study in the book of Genesis. But what about this tree of the knowledge of good and evil? What happened to it? Well, you can go around and you can find lots of speculation in a lot of different sources, but you will not find any scriptural explanation about what happened to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It doesn't say that God chopped it down or that he burned it up. As a matter of fact, to the contrary, it says that he placed cherub at the garden's entrance to keep anybody from getting to the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Did it disappear at the flood? We really don't know, do we? There's no scripture that tells us what happened to that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But it appears very clear that the tree of life got transplanted to heaven because we find it there in the book of Revelation. So if you want to do some study, I can save you a little bit of time. Uh, we know that we can find the tree, that is the tree of life, in Revelation 2.7, Revelation 22.2, Revelation 22:19 and Revelation 22:14. I think you'll be fascinated when you look it up. You find it, of course, twice in the book of Genesis, in chapter 2, verse 9, that we've just read. And then it'll be repeated again in chapter 2, verse 19, where God says, don't eat of it. So we know about the tree of life. But this tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil, what happened to it? <laughs> what did God do with it? Uh, we certainly don't want to know all that God knows uh, and be like him uh, because we don't have that need to know. God gave us free will, didn't he? Out of all of his creations, he only made one thing that was in his likeness and after him, and that was man and man would have the ability to think, to reason, to even learn from past knowledge and continue to grow in his knowledge. Interesting, isn't it, how God created man so uniquely different from all other animals. And we have nothing like it, no in-between. Uh, <laughs> it's hard to teach an animal even just a few things and then have him retain that and build upon that knowledge doesn't happen does it but it did so with man so we find this very fascinating uh, as we continue in chapter 2 the tree of life and it's available to every one of us through Jesus Christ we can eat freely of it it says if we go to heaven and that we'll have the ability to have the tree of life Adam and Eve would not have it because God would punish them by sending them out of the garden and keep them from going back in to eat of that tree. Even though he had not restricted that tree from them while they were living there and before they ate of the tree of good and the knowledge of good and evil. I hope that you'll take some time to slow down. Sometimes we only look at the highlights of Genesis 1 and 2 and we don't look at all the detail about the trees and about what they represent as well as the literal trees. But it's very, very clear. God made man unique. He made man after his own image. The ability to think and to reason and to build upon that knowledge. The ability to know God and to be one of his children. And I hope that you are. And that's my thought for the day. God bless you and have a wonderful day.